You used female narrators in all religions that are mostly represented by patriarchy. Why? <laughs> um, do you know, it was an accident and it just happened that way. <laughs> you know, we're trying to figure out how to tell the story of Jerusalem and in every way, you know, we talked about this earlier, you know, it's the most storied and enigmatic city on earth. It's been... Uh, books and films and poems and songs and paintings have been produced ad nauseum forever, but to how to do it differently, how to bring the city and the region to an audience in a completely new and wonderful and different way. And so, of course, IMAX and 3D was part of that. But then also, wouldn't it be lovely to hear about this part of the world from its kids, its youth? I mean, that is, of course, a core part of our audience um, here at the Science Center and other science centers and museums where this film plays. So we set out to cast um, the film for kids. And we interviewed a whole bunch of kids, all ages. Um, and then we found these three young women. And it, it, it wasn't that we ever intended to have the three women tell the story, but they were just clearly the most charismatic characters. And then this was suddenly another way to tell the story from this part of the world in a fresh way from 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 its young women and the future. Uh, at the back in red. Yes, uh, uh, okay, um, what were the logistics uh, for getting access to some of the holy sites and what kind of rig did you do for your overhead interior shots like inside the, the ceremony of the church and the five, holy five, or coming up to the light over the procession during Ramadan? I love your wonderful technical questions. Um, this is so LA. Um, the, the, the process of getting permissions was um, three, a three-year odyssey, uh, and it involved drinking cups of tea and some song, stronger substances, depending on who we were meeting with, endlessly, uh, until we'd earned their trust. And it was just a matter of convincing each community that, that we were going to show their story in a respectful manner. And the medium of IMAX is very helpful in that sense because we were able to explain that the Californian Science Center would never show a film that wasn't evenly balanced and uh, reasonable. So it, it was just a huge amount of trips to Israel and a lot of talking and a lot of, of, of smooth talking. I'd be happy to talk technical with you afterwards, but you know, a huge amount of effort went into those shots and Reed Smoot, our cinematographer, righteously won an award for it and as the king of the giant screen format. And uh, it's a lot of work, but they, they deliver, I think. Next question at the back on the, on the right. Yes, thank you. It was a very beautiful film. Thank you for presenting it. And as you just explained, it was difficult because of uh, the balance that you felt you needed to do. So I had uh, two quick questions. What was something that you really wanted to show but couldn't? And what was the most difficult to show? And I wanted to say the music was beautiful. I recognized a lot of traditional uh, themes. Uh, with the different groups of people, and um, were any of those traditional folk tunes included? question. <laughs> I, I could say what the most difficult shot was. I mean, the most difficult shot was, was Ramadan. That was a really, really hard shot to take. Um, and uh, that, took, that took five years. We, we got that at the last moment, um, and we weren't even sure we were going to get it. And we're so pleased it's in the film, because without it, we, we don't have the, the Muslim high note. So that was definitely the hardest shot. Uh, in terms of what we wanted to put in, is this a, did we mention one? No, probably not. It's never good to mention that. I don't know what that is. But um, uh, actually, the toughest part about making a film like this or any film or telling any story is what is, it, is that question, what, what stays in, what goes out. And really, at the end of the day, you've got to serve the story and the arc. And it, 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 it becomes clear after a while what must go and what must um, stay. So, no, I mean, I... I, I um, there are a number of shots that hit the cutting room floor, no doubt. Some of the sort of iconic places of the Bible um, that, that, uh, that didn't make it. Um, and, uh, um, but I think as a whole, you know, another element of making a film like this, um, hats off of course to Michael Brook who is here, is, is though is silence. It's, it's, it's finding room to 
just appreciate the visuals and be able to inhabit them without words getting in the way. Um, and I, I would expect that even today here for many of you, half of you might have a clue what was said by Benedict Cumberbatch because you're so caught up in the images. And in fact, having now seen the film, how many times is it? You know, 325 times. Um, I, it's so wonderful to be able to experience it in different ways each time. And I have to say, I love this screen. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, it's the best print I've ever seen. Uh, and the music, you've got to ask Michael. I mean, I know he, he went out of his way to, to bring in some authentic instruments and, and such forth. He did a tremendous job. Why don't you come down, Michael, and we can answer another question, um, and then Michael can speak to the process of the music. So, gen gentlemen here in the front with the great... Yeah, um, without getting too technical again, one of the great things about documentaries, of course, is capturing a um, culture or whatever without them acknowledging the camera per se that you're making a movie and you have this massive IMAX camera these are not the little cameras we're used to how did you become so invisible in all these communities well yeah right um, that's that's the editing process and actually I watch the film and I see little people in the corner looking at the camera and stuff and it really drives me mad um, do you know the bane of a modern documentary filmmakers is the iPad because people think iPads are cameras so they get into these special places and they hold up their iPads like this and, the, and there's a forest of iPads in the foreground and you're thinking it's a terrible camera and you're ruining the experience for everyone else. So the answer is um, you want to get up high, you want to be above people, you want to be in the front and you want to cut like crazy until you get the shot. But IMAX is such a, 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 a long running format, you know, you want to hold the shots like that amazing shot at the end with everything on fire and the guy coming towards you. You know, we had three cameras working in there, and everybody was filming all the time. And we got that one shot without iPads and people annoying us. And, and thank heavens, but it's, it's painful in the edit. You're like, no, look at that guy, he ruins it. Oh, yeah. So it's like that. Michael, do you want to do you want to speak to the music and your process and how you did that? Uh, there were kind of, um, I absorbed some of the, to, to answer your question about the traditional elements, um, there was never an attempt to specifically go traditional, um, but certainly I listened to a lot of it and some of it seeped in, but uh, there were no uh, precise references to anything uh, pre-existing. And a big challenge with the music was, well, it, it, as George said, it, it's such a feast of a film that I actually still think there should be less music in it. but. Um, because the visuals are, are just so engulfing, and then there's people talking, there's the narration. Um, and the, I, I also think the sound is incredible. I mean, it's just, it's so immersive, uh, such a powerful experience. Um, so that, it, that was a big challenge with the music to, to support that scale, but at the same time, not kind of add to the overall din and, and uh, overwhelm people. So it was, it was kind of a, a logistical, acoustic challenge with the music. And then trying to have some element that wasn't too on the money in, in terms of just representing the three different religions or referring to them in, in a kind of subtle way. I don't know if that answers your question, but let um, me know. Any other questions? Yes, please. Will this ever be produced in a, in a uh, format where we can get a, a, a copy? Do you know, um, so the question is, will this film ever be produced in a format you can get a copy? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, in, in time, uh, that will come. The, the key thing, though, now is to experience it on, on this screen and screens like this around the country, um, because this is where this is where it really truly is unique and transformative and immersive. And can I just say that what is so special, and hats off to the California Science Center, this is the first time it's been really properly paired with the Dead Sea Scrolls. So to see this film on this screen and walk next door and see the Dead Sea Scrolls in the flesh is an unbelievable blockbuster museum experience. So uh, we don't want to sell Blu-rays, we want to sell tickets to both shows. Please. <laughs> Uh, just the gentleman on the right, and then we'll come to you in, in the red again, if we can. Uh, 
well crazy when you go to Jerusalem and you hear the Muslims singing and you hear the Jewish prayers and you hear the Christian bells and they all come from Abraham and the insanity of everybody fighting each other. Okay, uh, the question is, is it, is it, a, is it a, um, the ending, was it a statement about peace? We were very careful with the end. You know, these girls are who they are, and they live in separate quarters, and this is their life. And the ending, we believe, accurately reflects the, the, the status quo at the moment. And we would like it to have been, a, 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 you know, more of a, a get-together at the end. But this is, this is the reality. Um, Can I actually, sorry to butt in, as usual. Um, <laughs> Uh, funnily enough, our executive producer, Jake Abbott, um, who wonderfully actually introduced uh, me to Michael um, several years ago for another film that we made, and was so formative in the, he's a producer and financier who made um, Gandhi and Driving Miss Daisy and Dances with Wolves and so on. He died tragically during this um, process. But what was the question that I'm trying to answer now that I've gone to Please. So he said, from, he said from the very beginning, he said, you've got to have these girls come together at the end. And he insisted on it. And Jake was always right. I mean, that was the thing about Jake. He was always right. He said, you've got to have the girls come together at the end. So we had a sequence that we shot of them coming together at the end. And in fact, during the process of making the film, they became friendly. And in fact, they have promoted the film um, in certain museums where it's opened. But we had this wonderful sequence, which is beautiful, with them sitting together and just talking and learning about each other. Um, and we put it into the film. And this is one of those shots, there was the question before, that um, soon came out because after a while you could tell that it was the filmmakers who wanted it there. It shouldn't be there. It, it, it wasn't supposed to be there. Um, and so it fell out and we, we showed the girls, the young women, um, that sequence and we showed them this sequence and they all felt that the way that it is here, as you see it, is the way that best reflects their reality. So, you know, the thing about these films, it's, it, you, you've got to be authentic. I mean, it, it, it's, it's totally authentic to how it is and to how these girls feel about it and to... Um, so is this a film about peace? Certainly, we want this to take you to places and understanding that you might not otherwise have by immersing you in these different worlds in this ancient city. Um, and, but it is what you make of it. I hate to be cryptic, but that is Jerusalem. Okay. Yes, last question perhaps. So did, the, did the girls help, uh, contribute to what they said or did you script it for them? And your early people who, who gave you permission, what was their response to seeing the film? Okay, so the girls um, very much wrote their own dialogue. Uh, I mean, it was a process of working with them because, you know, it's their Jerusalem. So our director, who can't be here today, um, you know, he spent a lot of time with them and, and, and sort of got out of them what it was they wanted to represent about Jerusalem. I mean, so, yes, of course, we helped them with the, with the, the, the exact perhaps, language, but it was this is their thinking and their thoughts absolutely on screen. Um, the film has not yet shown in Israel. Um, we're waiting for an IMAX theater to be built that can show it in the splendor to which it deserves. Um, and until then, it, it's not it's not been in Israel, so we can't comment on what um, everybody who helped us make it thinks. But we'd love them to see it. But 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 certainly the the reception so far for making a film that could be considered to be very political has been um, really very very positive amongst all quarters and all communities the response has been really positive and you know it's been out the way these films work they roll out in different communities at different times and then hopefully they play for for some time there but you know the film in the past year it's one that in our industry um the the best giant screen film and the best cinematography and national geographic our distributor won the best big idea for marketing outreach so we should thank actually National Geographic and Allied, which is a group that's working with them here, and the, and the um, California Science Center to get out the good word uh, um, um, about this, uh, this film. But it's, um, all people are coming to see it, and I think all people are really responding well to it. Any 
9.1 million dollars. Uh, 9.3. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on about that? Yeah, it was, it was an awful lot. I mean, to film these are best considered as cheap Hollywood movies. They're not thought of as as as, as documentaries. This is this is Hollywood production values. I mean, these you know we had to bring the helicopter in from somewhere up from another country to film, and uh, it's indescribably expensive process. Yeah, in the front there in the grave. One more. So um, I'm curious what your take is on the whole future of this giant screen format and you know why you chose this could have been made as a feature documentary I suppose and it might have been a lot different film but why did you choose this format and what's the well, we don't want to talk about that I mean we love this format how, how, how can you sorry I'm going to be difficult how can you ask that question or maybe you can and it's fair enough but when you see some of those shots I mean I watched this film again right and I'm sitting up there with my cousin Charlie and I'm watching some of those some of those shots and I could just I would make another film over five years and try and raise nine million dollars oh, just God. to sit in where we are actually with me <laughs> just to sit and watch a shot that to me is the most transcendent experience that I mean the approach to the Dome of the Rock sequence <laughs> can I also say uh, the other thing is is that this is the most immersive medium in the world and if you want to reach kids which is what this is about if you want to reach kids the IMAX screen in these museums is the single best way to do it in the world they sit here for 45 minutes they can't look at their Facebook pages they can't tweet they can't do anything else and they are absolutely absorbed and and you know this is a, a cultural film but you ask any current NASA astronaut and he will tell you he or she will tell you they are in space because they saw an IMAX film about space and these films inspire people to do crazy and amazing things and that's why we, we love making them because we're reaching people in a way that no other medium can. YouTube does not do what this does. Next question. Thank you. In the middle there. Um, I wanted to ask, how did you get Benedict Cumberbatch involved? And oh, yeah, this why, is my question. And, and why isn't he here? Okay, how did we get Benedict Cumberbatch and why isn't he here? Very good, very good. Uh, unfortunately, they rather selfishly released this after the Oscars, and I kept saying, if you can pull it forward, we might be able to get Benedict to come, because, of course, he was in town for the Oscars. But as I said, I said, you know, he's not going to hang around after, because either he's won, in which case he's in Hawaii, or he's lost, in which case he's in Hawaii. But he sure isn't going to be in L.A. So that, that was a given. We got Benedict. He was our first choice, and I called his agent, and... You know, the thing about Benedict is he's a very clever, thoughtful person. He really is. And he was immediately interested in Jerusalem. He wanted to learn about the city. He wanted to be involved in it. And he turned up at the, at the read-through, at the narration. Most people, I believe, who, who do narrations, they haven't even read the script when they turn up. They have no idea what the film is. They're put in a car. They deliver to a studio. They look at the page and they start reading. He arrived, he watched the film twice, he came with literally a list of questions and was absolutely engaged for, uh, throughout the process. So, you know, hats off to him, I think he does a great job and of course we'd have loved him to be here. Yeah. <laughs> on the end there. Do you have a specific moment or day that was the most memorable for you during the whole process? Yeah, you do that one. Well, I mean, there are quite a few and that, that's sort of one of the joys, but I think one of the joys for me actually was the filming in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre because to get the shots that we did um, of the tomb in particular and lower down in the crypts of um, you know the place the Christian graffiti and some of those sequences down there in the church we had to be locked in to the church overnight so that church door the Church of the Holy Sepulchre door closes at nine o'clock and that's it. No one comes in or out, not the Pope, not anyone. That's it, nine o'clock. So they took in our 50-person crew, uh, and we were locked in until the doors opened at 6 a.m. in the morning. And we did all the filming, and then we all fell asleep around the Stone of Unction at about 4 in the morning. And a few of us came up with some horror film ideas and things like that. <laughs> but... Um, but it was a really, it was a remark, you know, you, you, you were sleeping with your head on a rock next to the stone of unction, and it was a powerful, spiritual, amazing experience. Uh, yeah, at the back then. Thank you so much for bringing uh, such a beautiful presentation of these three faiths coming together. But considering the way people are, have you received any criticism? Do you know, uh, the question is, have we received any criticism? I'm slightly shocked by how little we've received. We haven't actually received any substantive criticism whatsoever. 
Uh, the answer is no. I mean, people, uh, you know, people have their own private opinions, perhaps, but you can't really argue with, I believe, the the representation of the three faiths, and that's the mechanism of having the girls. You know, this is their Jerusalem. So we're, we're not taking a position here. This is this is their Jerusalem. It is what it is. I think maybe we should wrap that up. So um, thank you very much to everyone, and we're here to answer any further questions.